Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's Lost Hero. Well, this presentation is brought to you in cooperation with The Real American Revolution and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. Our guest today is Dr. William M. Fowler, Jr., a professor of history at Northeastern University in Boston. He served as director of the Massachusetts Historical Society from 1998 through 2005. And Dr. Fowler is also a prolific author who has written over a dozen published works. We're privileged to have him with us today. So Christian, why don't you get us started and with the first questions. Well, welcome to the show and I really, you know, on a personal note, I really wanted to thank you because I think it was 10 or 12 years ago, I had emailed a research question to you and I had emailed it to a bunch oh. of people and I think you were the only one who responded to me. So was I, was I correct? Yes, yes. Did I get the right answer? So I really appreciated that you took the time then and we appreciate that you're taking the time now to, to speak to us, so. Well, I think anyone who sends a question, takes the time to send a question deserves an answer. Well, and, and it, Again, I don't know if it really gave me a lot of confidence and I appreciate it. So uh, I, I had to just mention that. So thank you again. Now I wanted to, let's, let's start here. You know, you've written extensively about a variety of subjects in early American history. And really I wanted to know, you know, what brought you to these time periods and in particular for our show, what got you writing about revolutionary Boston and men such as John Hancock and Samuel Adams? Well, Christian, for me, writing is a rather personal thing. And your question raises memories for me. Uh, as a child, I grew up here in the greater Boston area where my family had been Irish immigrants, had been for some time. And these were in the days, of course, when you, uh, the family took the dreaded automobile trip in the summertime. You know, you got in the car and you went somewhere. And my father, who was not well-educated, but read a great deal, his car, our car always seemed to pull over to the side of the road whenever there was an historical plaque. And my first memory of visiting a historical place was Fort Ticonderoga, which I still hold and cherish. So my family was interested in history. Um, my family encouraged me to read, and I read. Growing up in Boston, surrounded by history, and so I was fascinated. And then I remember one day, perhaps in the fifth or sixth grade, our class went on one of those field trips, you know, and we went to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And as we went through the galleries, I saw this magnificent portrait of John Hancock. It's, it's really quite a stunning portrait. And that interested me in him. And then there were portraits of Samuel Adams and Paul Revere. These were, to me, real people, not just historical figures, but they were real people. And so as I continued through junior high and high school, my interest in history continued. And I had the great good fortune to have some wonderful, wonderful history teachers in high school who encouraged me to pursue this. And so I went off to college, to the university, and not really knowing what I wanted to do, but loving history, I majored in history. And there these doors just opened to me and just went forward. I had a wonderful, again, encountered magnificent teachers at college at Northeastern University who encouraged me, always encouraged me. Uh, not being someone from a college-educated family, I was the first one in my family to go to college. I didn't know anything about graduate school until a teacher of mine, history teacher, sort of put his arm around me and said, you ought to go to graduate school. And I took his advice. I went to graduate school and I went to the University of Notre Dame. Wonderful, wonderful institution. But there I was in the Midwest. And as I was in the Midwest, my interest in New England grew ever greater. I, I wanted to know more about New England. And so when it came time to do my dissertation, I decided I wanted to do something about the American Revolution and, and maybe something about the sea. Being a New Englander, I was interested in the sea. And I found a topic that did and lead, did it led me into the study of the history of the Navy of the American Revolution. And so from there, it just went forward. I have an insatiable curiosity. And my curiosity extends to wanting to know more about these people who were so instrumental, or not instrumental, who formed our nation. And fortunately for, for the historian, 18th century documents still do exist in print. They, thank heavens they didn't have word processes or computers. And so since they could only write by hand, there's a limited number of documents. 
And so it's a great joy to get into those documents and write about these people. Yeah, and, 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 that, and that brings me to my next question because I've always found the relationship between Hancock and Adams fascinating and, and, and really because in so many ways there's such polar opposites and you think about age, finances, backgrounds, uh, how uh, monastic Sam Adams was compared to John Hancock and, and really maybe even bravado. C can you fill us in a little bit on the relationship between them? John Hancock and Samuel Adams had an intriguing relationship. Hancock, of course, was a wealthy young man, a bit of a popinjay, frankly, dressed elegantly, went around town in a fine carriage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He loved attention and a lot of it. The challenge that John Hancock had, and a challenge, by the way, that other well-to-do aristocratic colonials had, is that no matter how rich they were, no matter how deep their family roots went, no matter how famous they were, there was a glass ceiling. They were nonetheless forever colonials. John Hancock felt that very much. He was a man of great pride. And so when colonial governors or others looked down upon him because he was a colonial, it angered him. And so there was a certain uncomfortableness in his character towards authority, particularly the king's authority which was pretty much submerged as it was for most colonials until the 1760s, when as a result of the great debt that the empire had incurred in fighting the French and Indian War, parliament began to levy taxes on Americans and levy taxes on John Hancock. He resented that, stood against it because it offended him in a sense almost personally, but also offended his community in which he was very proud. Now, Samuel Adams is a somewhat different character. These two men, by the way, come to the same end point. They come to the same conclusion, but they come from a different path. Samuel Adams is a Puritan by nature. He loves his community. He is a very local man. Indeed, Samuel Adams never really goes on to much national significance. He has great difficulty moving beyond the confines of Boston and Massachusetts. But that doesn't bother him because this is where he belongs. This is what he loves. He loves the town meeting. He loves the governmental structure. He loves the Puritan Congregational Church. He takes great pride in his home. He is a somewhat simple man, but don't exaggerate that. He's simple in his demeanor and simple in his dress, but he's not simple in any other way. He's cagey and very, very bright. He and Hancock, by the way, are both Harvard graduates. And so when Parliament and the King begin to intrude on the rights of Massachusetts and Boston, Samuel Adams is outraged because they're trespassing on his rights, trespassing on the rights of his fellow citizens. And so he rebels against that. Samuel Adams is also a superb organizer. He is the classical ward politician. While Hancock is sitting in his mansion up on Beacon Hill, kind of presiding over this, Sam Adams is down in the town meeting counting votes. And that's what he does very well. He knows how to organize. He knows how to rally. He knows how to manipulate. And so the two make an interesting pair. Here is Sam Adams, the guy in the hustings down below, manipulating, talking to people, maneuvering in the town meeting, counting all these votes. And here's Hancock, the notable wealthy young gentleman living on top of Beacon Hill. So they each represent a kind of certain each side of what the revolutionary character was right about. Fine and rich merchants and the townspeople, the mechanics as they were called. So they come from different places, they come to the same conclusion and work together. Not always happily. I think that Samuel Adams did not appreciate uh, Hancock's high lifestyle. And I'm not sure that Hancock always appreciated uh, Samuel Adams's critique of him. Right. And, and you know, this, this really leads me to my next question I'd love for you to pick apart. But, you know, I've read a lot of history books and done research, but and and you know a lot of historians have made speculations and assertions as to why Samuel Adams had become such a vehement radical. Mm -hmm. And you really uh, shrewdly touched upon the land bank controversy and how that yes. e event may have even pushed Adams to become such a dedicated patriot. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about his road to radicalism? Yes, that's a very good point, Christian, because the land bank indicates 
Adams's personal, personal resentment. The land bank was a complicated financial affair in which Samuel Adams is front of them, De Deacon Adams invested fairly heavily. Uh, it was a kind of speculative venture. And eventually the royal government, the governor in, in general, the governor uh, suppressed the land bank, just more or less eliminated it. Uh, Samuel Adams' father took a very heavy hit. And so there was a personal and financial grudge that Samuel Adams had against the royal authority. And that indeed helped to, again, fuel his resentment against royal authority being imposed upon him and upon his community. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's funny because not only did I read that in your Samuel Adams biography, mm -hmm. which is a spectacular book, and anyone with even a marginal interest oh, in, in Sam Adams or the revolution should read that book, but you appeared on one of these history documentaries, and you were talking... And they broke to commercial after you had been speaking, and they asked the audience to sort of guess which event led Samuel Adams to become such a vehement radical, and one of them was the land bank controversy. Yes. So I just thought... <laughs> yes. It certainly sparked him. There's no question about that. And again, it gets to Samuel Adams' grievances, which are deeply personal. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Fowler, I'm fascinated by your research process. During your research, which obviously has yielded a tremendous amount of information, it's fascinating. Could you share with us any finds that you found are particularly significant or maybe even something that might have shocked you during your research? Well, I can't think of any spectacular discovery. What, research, what historical research is, is the careful, careful prodding through the documents. I can't emphasize that too much. History must be written from the most original sources you can find. And so always, I would tell my students, always, always, always go to the documents and go through the documents. Take your time. Now, I must say, and I say this very willingly and gratefully, thank heavens for librarians. I cannot tell you how many times <laughs> I have yes, gone yeah. into an archive. And I've looked at the preliminary description of the archive. I've looked at the indices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all the printed material, I think before you go to an archive, look at all the printed material so you can navigate through the, through the material that you're looking at. But having done that, to go to a library and say, I'm interested in this and this and this, and I've looked at this and this and this, might you have any suggestions? Almost always do finest words a, a librarian can say to me are, uh, have you looked at this? And then they show me. And that often, many, many times, has led me into finding other material. So it's a careful process. It's not serendipity. Sometimes it's not even very romantic, you know, although I must tell you, I don't think I'm ever more comfortable than I'm when, an when I'm in an archives looking at manuscripts. I just find that delectable, absolutely delectable. But it's hard persistent work. So the sudden eurekas, well, not really, not okay. really. Things that are interesting, and things, by the way, the other thing, it's not that a particular document is astounding. It's when you put the documents together and you begin to see what is happening. And that's where the narrative comes in. You must, the individual documents link together, talking to one another in a way, begin to reveal the narrative. And that's the job of the historian is to create a narrative out of these documents, a narrative that is as true as possible that relates to the actual actual events of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's so eloquently said, I can't even tell you, I, I couldn't agree with you more when, when I'm in a historical society or museum or and and I'm speaking to the librarian and all of a sudden they open up a treasure trove for you that yes. that you that you didn't yes. even know was there and you know it's I, right. you know I, I just I totally support what you just said and I, I think librarians definitely deserve a, a lot more credit than they're given but I, I, oh, I, I just, yeah I, so, I was simply I was simply going to add your, your question about discovering documents there are two instances where there were documents that I didn't discover them, by the way, they, they were normally other people, but they were a discovery to me. When I was director of the Massachusetts Historical Society, one of the greatest American archives in the entire country, an incredible, incredible collection. Uh, since I was the director, I could sort of wander about. Uh, it used to drive the curators crazy, but I just love to go and look. 
I, I used to love to go and look what I call it, the stuff. That's not a very technical term, but the stuff. <laughs> and so there are two occasions when looking at stuff really took me aback a bit. Massachusetts Historical Society has the papers of Thomas Jefferson. In fact, there are more Jefferson manuscripts, Massachusetts Historical Society than are in Virginia, including his uh, farm books, which are his daily recordings of everything that went on at Monticello. So one day I was looking at the Jefferson papers and I opened up one of the farm books and I was going through it and it's very meticulous. Uh, grain, wheat, corn, cows, pigs, hogs, slaves, cows, pigs, hogs, grain, slaves, beans. There was no differentiating here between hogs, beans, wheat, and slaves. Beans, you know. And what struck me as I read that is so many times we have heard how sensitive Jefferson was to slavery or how much he disdained slavery. Well, here in this particular book that he was keeping, he didn't make any differentiation between slaves and the other things going on on the farm. So it's hard for me to believe as he kept his records that he was moved by slavery. It just struck me as just an ordinary observation. No grand interpretation there. The other event that really did uh, impact me and led me to writing another book, frankly, again, walking through the stacks, I was up in the vault area and there in the vault on the shelf was this red leather binder. I, I took it down from the shelf and I opened it up and there, in George Washington's own hand was his Newburgh address. The address that he gave at Newburgh, New York, March of 1783. And it was in his own hand. Now, I suspect many of your listeners and viewers know the story of the Newburgh address, how the army was on the edge of mutiny, ready to march on to Philadelphia to demand back pay. And now Washington addressed the officers at a very vital moment, and he urged them not to do anything on toward. He said he stood before them as citizen and soldier. Notice the context of the words, citizen and soldier. And he persuaded them not to march in Philadelphia, and they did not. Well, the speech he gave, a very moving speech that he gave that day, was indeed, I was holding it in my hands. It is the thing. I knew about the Newburgh Address. The original Newburgh Address was written by one of Washington's secretaries. And it is in the Washington Papers at the Library of Congress. It's in a fine hand, but in a small hand. The address I was looking at was in a very large hand, Washington's own hand. And I was reminded of the story of the Newburgh Address. When Washington was speaking to the soldiers, he reached into his pocket to pull out the address. And as he did, he put on a pair of glasses. And he said to his officers, gentlemen, you must forgive me. My eyes have grown dim and my hair has grown gray in the service of my country. It was a tearjerker, tearjerker. Right. Now I had to pause for a moment and imagine what it was like the day before Washington gave his address. Here he is at his Newburgh headquarters and his secretary hands him the speech. Here it is, your excellency. Washington looked at it, didn't have his glasses on, <laughs> looked at it, he thought to himself, I'll never be able to read it. <laughs> and so what he did is he sat down and he recopied the address in his own very large hand oh. so that he would be able to read it with his glasses. And so there I was holding this document, which was, came from an event that saved the American Republic. Uh, that's when I decided I needed to write about the Newburgh Address. And so that's when I went forward and began my research and began my writing to do a book about the Newburgh Address called The American Crisis. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, it's, it really is amazing the, the, the amount of uh, published works you have. And, and really, I mean, I know it really is from, from this time period. But again, you write about the sea, you've written about Washington, you've written about Hancock, and you've written about Adams. So now I have to bother you to go back to Hancock and Adams. <laughs> All right, go right ahead. Go so I have ahead. to ask you this. So, so we know that really Hancock and Adams made the Crown's most wanted list in yeah, the 1770s. Yeah. But, but plenty of radical agitators were resisting Crown policies throughout the colonies. You know, obviously, first and foremost, that comes to our mind is Dr. Joseph Warren. But 
What was it about these men in particular that galled the, the crown so much? And, and could they have been as successful in their radical agenda without the other in their corner? Well, what set Hancock and Adams apart? First of all, they were Bostonians. That was bad enough. Uh, Boston had a very bad reputation uh, after 17, in the 1760s and early 1770s. Tea Party, Boston Massacre. Uh, the parliament, the ministers in London probably thought that Boston was filled with radicals. So Hancock and Adams, for them, epitomized these Boston radicals. So they were anxious to get them. Uh, and so also they were very well known. And indeed, they had stood against the crown. And certainly Adams had and Hancock had as well. So they were very anxious, the governor, the royal governor, was, was anxious to get them. Now, this becomes a moment of some confusion though. You know, this is the 18th century. The fact of the matter is that in Boston in 1775, the British were confined to the town. And so their authority outside of the town was virtually, they had virtually no authority. So it's really not even very clear that they, that the governor, first Governor Hutchinson and then Governor Gage, ever really intended to seize Hancock and Adams. Because the question would be, what would they do if they seized Hancock and Adams? So I think it was a very tender, a very politically damaging point. At this point, 1775, following Lexington and Concord, there was still some hope, dimming quickly to be sure, but some, still some hope for reconciliation. So I'm not sure that they that Gage really wanted to arrest Hancock and Adams. He simply wanted to assert British authority. I think if, he had, if his troops had in fact managed to arrest Hancock and Adams and bring them back to Boston, it would have been a very, very difficult situation. Yeah, so, okay, now, so let's tackle this then, because you, you're, you're the guy to do this. So we know at times John Hancock has been portrayed as, as mm -hmm. let, let's say, the go-to money guy for Samuel Adams and the Patriot cause. And there's been exaggerations of Hancock. And, and one of these quotes that comes to mind is referring to John Hancock as having deep pockets and shallow brains, which, <laughs> in, in, which in some ways kinds of cast him as a sort of dim-witted uh -huh. puppet of, of the father of the American Revolution, yeah. sort of just as Samuel Adams has been sort of portrayed as this shabbily dressed troublemaker relying on hand, handouts from Hancock and sort of duping him out of his poor fortune to propel the cause. Was this really anything more than exaggerated crown gossip? And, and can you really unpack the truth for us? John Hancock was a great patriot. Of that, there is no question. He was committed to the patriot cause. Now, he may have come to it a little bit more slowly than Samuel Adams did. True enough. But when he committed himself, it was full bore. Imagine, this is a man, a very wealthy man, one of the wealthiest men in America who sacrificed his wealth. He sacrificed his wealth in the cause of American independence. He risked his life. When he signed the Declaration of Independence, he was signing his own death warrant. So don't underestimate John Hancock's commitment to the cause of independence. He was an enormously successful politician, never lost an election. Elected governor of the Commonwealth in 1780, and with one exception, when he decided not to run for re-election, he was re-elected every year. He was also a man of keen political instincts. He was a man who could, in a sense, not only was he a revolutionary to raise up the alarm, he could also calm people down. In 1786 and 80, early 1787 in Massachusetts, there was what was called Shays' Rebellion. It wasn't really a rebellion. It was a rising of farmers in the western part of the Commonwealth who were oppressed with taxes. They were seeking to close the courts. Now, they did take up arms. That's true. The governor, not then John Hancock, but James Bowden, dispatched militia to put down the rebellion, which they did fairly easily. John Hancock then came back into the governorship. There was a cry among some, including from Samuel Adams, that the men who had risen in rebellion against the Commonwealth ought to be tried and executed. John Hancock refused to do that. He understood that bringing peace and harmony back to the Commonwealth would not be achieved by random executions. There needed to be reconciliation. And so he pardoned the Shazites. He pardoned the Shazites. And it worked, by the way. 
His pardon of the Shazites calmed the waters and brought sense back to the Commonwealth. So he was a man of good instincts. He was a man who sacrificed a great deal in the cause of the American Revolution. Oh, yes, he was a popinjay, and, and yes, he, he loved attention. That's all very true. Yes, he had a great ego. What politician doesn't? But we should never forget his contribution to the American Revolution. He lost his fortune, and he risked his life. Dr. Fowler, right. I'd like to inject a little question here as a follow-up to that. Uh, could you address the issue of smuggling? Because uh, I know that uh, there's been a TV series called, uh, you know, Sons of Liberty, mm -hmm. where they're trying to portray these individuals uh, in different ways. And smuggling seems to be a major factor. Uh, you see Hancock, Warren, and Adams all talking in the middle of a warehouse about what they're going to do about the British uh, searching their warehouses. And you see these people walking behind them with these huge cases of wine. So... <laughs> And we know what they're doing. So could you address smuggling? Because that's sometimes overlooked when you look at that period of time, which led to the British crackdown. Smuggling was to 18th century Boston, like uh, driving over 55 miles an hour is to us in the 21st century. <laughs> okay. uh, that is, <laughs> yeah, we, we all know it's the law. Got that one. Uh, but we all, we all do it. And there's not a lot of enforcement. Uh, smuggling was rampant. Uh, it was easy to do. And obviously, what encouraged smuggling was high tariffs, high duties. If you want to encourage smuggling, just up the duty. I mean, that's true in the right. 18th century. It's true in the 21st century. And so American merchants were, were quite adept at smuggling. And the customs commissioners who were appointed by the king were men, shall we say, of uh, questionable morals and ethics. It used to be said that the merchant's pay was surer than the king's which is to say that it was, you're probably better off taking a few bribes than trying to enforce the laws. And so yes, smuggling was, was rampant. There's no question about that. But again, I wanna emphasize that much of the smuggling was done because of the laws, the tariffs, the duties that were inappropriately, just overly harsh, sure. imposed by the crown uh, on American merchants. And so they took the easy way out with very lax enforcement. Smuggling was very easy. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Well, now we get to embarrass you a little bit. So when you, <laughs> when you left the Massachusetts Historical yeah. Society, you were honored for your service. And I'm going to read this quote that was, that was made by okay. you. And it says, Bill Fowler brought our society into a leadership role in the cultural and intellectual life of Boston, the state, and even the nation. He has kept this mission at the forefront of his work, and we intend to go forward in that spirit. Can you talk a little bit about your tenure at, at Mass Historical and, and what it's meant to you? Yes, I had a great team. You know, I was the director, that's true. But when I arrived in 1998, I had a team that was ready to go. They were in the starting gate. They were ready to charge ahead. And really, I think when I look back upon it, I let them go. <laughs> Sometimes I didn't know what they were doing, by the way. This was a time when we launched did, into the digital world. You know, I'm something of a Luddite, and I don't think I knew much about the digital world, but what I did know was that it's a good thing. And what I also recognized is I had a staff who knew how to do it. So giving them the reins, letting them go, encouraging them to do these things was really what my, my main achievement was. I think the second thing that struck me when I was there was what a treasure this was that is a society and how few people knew about it. What I wanted to do was I wanted to open the doors to the world, in particular, being a teacher myself, and that's really what I am and what I've always been. I wanted students. I wanted others, students and studies to come. And so we started an education program, not just for scholars coming in. We, we did that and we do it very well, but for high school teachers and others to introduce them to these magnificent, magnificent collections that they could use in their classrooms. It was, a, it was an adventure for me. I was never happier than when Miss Grundy came through the front door with her sixth grade. Again, I think sometimes the staff were a little bit hesitant, you know, they might touch things, uh, but that was, that was okay. That was okay. And bringing teachers into this. I might add, and I, I just want to say this very, very generously, that in doing this and opening up the society and bringing in teachers, I had encouragement from what I consider to be America's greatest living historian, David McCullough. David had come to the society many times working with John Adams, and I got to know David fairly well. 
And at every step, he was always there to encourage, to encourage, to encourage more people to come in, more people, more teachers, more students to open up. And the staff wanted to do that too. So it was enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the materials, the enormous materials, enthusiasm for making them available in this digital world, this revolution digital world, bringing people in. It was a joy. It was a great ride. Awesome. Nice. Well, Dr. Fowler, as we approach the coming 250th anniversaries of the revolutionary events that are being planned and occurred in Boston, I know the Massachusetts Historical Society has been heavily involved in planning activities and events. Do you think there'll be a renewed sense of interest in the years that really led to American independence? I think that Boston, two, Boston 250, uh, which is an organization now, a very vibrant, very active organization, is doing precisely that, is bringing to the attention of people of the Commonwealth and elsewhere too, to be certain, mm -hmm. the important events that did in fact lead to the revolution. You know, every generation stands on the shoulders of the previous generation. And the revolutionaries of 1775 and 1776 stood on the shoulders of those men and women who had come before. Uh, nothing just suddenly starts in history. It always has an origin. There's always a reason why something happened and always people behind it. So I think that looking at the 250, looking at the years leading up to the revolution, help us to recognize not only what a previous generation did in making the path towards revolution possible, but maybe it ought to remind us in our own time that as we celebrate our own accomplishments in the 21st century, that we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us. And so I think it's vitally important for civic education, for history to understand that so that we don't become too taken up with ourselves and are willing to recognize and acknowledge those who came before in the hope perhaps that those who come after us will recognize us. Mm -hmm. Right, wow. very insightful. Well, that concludes today's interview with the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society. Bill, thank you for mu so much for joining us. We hope you'll come back. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Randy. Thank you very much, Christian. It's always yeah. a delight to always a delight to reach out beyond the classroom. Yeah, and I, I, I can think of no better way for the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society to end the year on a high note than to host you and and have you share your scholarship and insights with us on Revolutionary Boston and two of our most famous revolutionaries. Um, and I, no, I just, as they would have said, as they would have said in the 18th century, huzzah for Joseph Warren. <laughs> well said and you know i think you're a great scholar but i think you're an even better man so really thank you for joining us and oh, and, and i want to thank you for the help you gave me early on all those years ago so to our viewers and listeners on behalf of randy flood and myself thanks for watching and listening and we'll see you next time thanks again bill thank you and come back thank you so much